Hello and welcome to a portion authentic word Bible studies. I just dropped the <laughs> having a blooper reel at the top. We're here at um authentic word Bible studies, the original series from 2015. That's a photo that I took in 2014. Um, this Bible study was birthed right after we did the renewal of the mind project and um. I started going through the book of Acts. So there is another series from 2015 through 2019 where I've already gone through the entire book of Acts. It was more didactic, line upon line, precept upon precept. This time around, we're just going through the Passion Translation with all of the footnotes to the Passion Translation, seeing the compound revelation and abundant grace as we're growing and increasing in our understanding of the book of Acts, where I was encouraged to read through the book of Acts regularly so that whole, because we live in a 2911 life that there are 28 books in the book of Acts. We're the 29th book that Holy Spirit is yet living through us as we're living that Hebrews 11 wall of faith. So Holy Spirit, we give you access to give us revelation, illumination, knowledge, insight, wisdom, grace upon grace upon grace to fulfill and understand the portal of Acts chapter eight that we're walking into right now. As we look at what it means to see Saul that persecuted the believers, that we would see any area in us that's been in a persecute persecutory way toward anyone who was believing because our understanding was skewed and off. We were sincerely wrong in the opposite direction, but there is yet time. There is yet uh, a plan from our God and so we say, have your way. Help us see, Lord, as we begin. We're at Acts chapter eight. Grab your uh, spiral notebook, pen, paper, your uh, passion translation, whether it's on your phone. I actually have a couple of paper copies of it over there as well. And so Saul persecutes the believers. This is where we're beginning. Now, Saul agreed to be an accomplice to Stephen stoning and participated in his execution. Remember, as we went out of Acts chapter 7, they was excited throwing stones at Stephen as he manifested the glory of God um, as heaven touched earth on that day. It says, and from that day on, a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem began. All the believers scattered into the countryside of Judea and among the Samaritans, except the apostles who remained behind in Jerusalem. Now, look, if we go back to Acts chapter one, verse eight, they were supposed, the instructions were, you will have power to go to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost, but they hadn't gone. They had stayed still centralized. So this persecution had a purpose. It was to get them to go out and, and exercise the power. So verse two, God-fearing men gave Stephen a proper burial and mourned greatly over his death. Then Saul mercilessly persecuted the church of God, going from house to house into the homes of believers to arrest both men and women and drag them off to prison. Paul, like I said, he was sincerely wrong because you guys are not... Um, living the way that we think according to our religious standards. So we're going to have to take y'all out. And he was serious about it. He was dragging them out. Didn't matter, male or female. He just didn't care because he was, he thought he was helping God. How many of us have been strong about something and we just knew we were right? You know, you're going to hell on a roller coaster when, you know, with no brakes and no and grease. We saying all this kind of stuff because we think that we got a hell or a heaven to put somebody in. All right, keep reading. The gospel spreads to Samaria. And remember, the Samaritans are the half-breeds. Hello? Although the believers were scattered by persecution, they preached the wonderful news of the word of God wherever they went. Philip traveled to a Samaritan city, um, the main city of Samaria. Many believe this was the Samaritan city of Sebasse. And he preached to them the wonderful news of the anointed one. The crowds were eager to receive, um, which uh, is translated from the Aramaic, which indicates they did more than just hear the good news. They silenced those who said anything against Philip's message. So they were listening and they were shutting down people. They were standing up for the gospel, for the kingdom message that was coming forward. So the crowds were eager to receive Philip's message and were persuaded by the many miracles and wonders he performed. Now, here we go again. 
Miracle signs and wonders follow the believers and then believers begin to believe, people begin to believe when they see the miracle signs and wonders. I'm not seeking it. It's, a, it's an after effect of me believing in the kingdom and being a kingdom ambassador for such a time as this. Verse seven, many demon possessed people were set free and delivered as evil spirits came out of them with loud screams and shrieks and many who were lame and paralyzed were also healed. So healings, miracles, and deliverances were being accomplished through others, not just the apostles. See, it wasn't limited to just the apostles. That's why I'm saying it is not the acts of the apostles. It is the acts of Holy Spirit through the believers, the whosoever will believe. And so this resulted in an uncontainable joy filling the city. Doesn't that sound like something we need in 2024? An uncontainable joy, not just for me and my four no more, but it's going to fill the city. That's why we have to run tell that. And now we get to somebody who was seeing things the wrong way. Here's another person that saw things the wrong way. His name is Simon the Sorcerer, but he was converted. But was he fully converted? Let's just keep reading and see why I say that. Verse nine. Now there was a man who lived there who was steeped in sorcery. For some time, he had astounded the people of Samaria with his magic, boasting to be someone great. Um, the Aramaic is, he boasted of himself saying, I am the great God, lowercase g. Everyone from the least to the greatest among them was dazzled by his sorcery. Um, they were all praying to him or bowing down to him. See, so they were feeding something in him narcissistically, making him think that it was about him instead of God. That's the whole, I, the enemy, uh, what's his name? Lucifer said within himself, I will ascend. Yeah. Uh-huh. You want, you want worship. So they were dazzled by his sorcery. They were saying, this man is the greatest wizard of all. That right there is telling you is wrong. We don't serve wizards. But anyway, this man is the greatest wizard of all. The divine power of God walks among us. See, they're mixing. You're getting mixture. For many years, everyone was in awe of him. Look, so it wasn't just an overnight success. It said many years. Mm -hmm. Many were in awe of him because of his astonishing displays of the magic arts. Look, it's not even miracle signs and wonders. That's why we can't look at gifts and judge and say, oh, that's a man of God because the gifts were operating. Keep going. But as Philip preached the wonderful news of God's kingdom realm, hello, the Bible is a portal into the spirit realm. And what was Philip preaching? He was preaching the wonderful news of God's kingdom realm. And the name of Jesus, the anointed one, he was, that's what he was preaching, the, the wonderful news of God's kingdom realm and the name of Jesus, the anointed one. So as he was preaching this, many believed his message and were baptized, both men and women. Hello, I love that. Both men and women. But religion, religious zealots have made people say, uh-uh, women can't be, no, they were just like in Genesis, God created mankind, male and female, he created them. So when the spirit is coming and being poured out and belief is being made evident, it's both men and women that are believing that we are the sons of God. Mm -hmm. Verse 13, even Simon believed and was baptized. Wherever Philip went, Simon was right by his side, astounded by all the miracle signs and enormous displays of power that he witnessed. So look, he was astounded by what he was operating in the counterfeit of when the genuine showed up, it caused him to be amazed. Uh-huh. Let's keep going. Verse 14. So when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had accepted God's message of life, they sent Peter and John to pray over them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit or take hold of the Holy Spirit. For they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and were yet to have the Holy Spirit fall upon them. As soon as Peter and John arrived, they laid their hands on the Samaritan believers one after another, and the Holy Spirit fell and filled each one of them. So implied in the text, the Greek is they took hold of the Holy Spirit. That is the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. See, it goes both ways. Um, the presence of the Holy Spirit comes and you have to tap into it. If you reject it, it'll bounce right off like a ricochet. Mm-hmm. Verse 18, uh, when Simon saw the Holy Spirit was released through the laying on of the apostles' hands, see, he was trying to understand the, the miracles or the magic or the wonders that he that they were doing. 
So he, he put it together and he said, oh, when they lay hands, it comes. So he's like, oh, that's how you get it. So when he saw the land on the hands, he approached them and offered them money saying, I want this power too. I'm willing to pay you for the anointing that you have, like you could for the authority. You can't pay for authority. The, the currency for authority is, is faith, is belief, is trust. Uh-huh. He said, so that I can also lay my hands on everyone to receive the Holy Spirit. Peter rebuked him and said, your money will be with you to destruction. Ma Look, Mammon was trying to understand the authentic move of God. Keep going. He said, how could you even think that you could purchase God's supernatural gift with money? See, Mammon will make you think that money it rules the world. What system are you in? How could you even think? Keep going. You'll never have this gift or take part in this ministry or you have no part with us in this word, in this logos. The Aramaic is you have no portion, no portion in this faith. Now we're living in the 29, 11. We're living in the Hebrews 11 hall of faith. But he's saying, when you come in trying to buy the anointing, throwing your money around and your title and your status and your clout and your years of being able to operate in the counterfeit, you don't have no portion in this. Oh, Jesus, you speaking a lot right there. Um, for your heart is not right with God. See, it's a heart issue. You don't have no part in it because you, you, your heart ain't right. And then he said, repent this moment for allowing such wickedness to fill you. Look, this is reminding me of back in Acts 5, how Satan was the one that brought the wickedness to Ananias' heart. And he's telling, he, they're giving, they giving them an opportunity to repent. It says, plead with the Lord that perhaps he would forgive you the treachery of your heart. For I discern that jealous envy has poisoned you and binds you as a captive to sin. Hello, Je jealous envy or bitter anger has poisoned you. Now, why was he jealous and envious? Why did he have bitter and angry anger? Because he was operating in it the way he knew how to operate in it. Then y'all come and supersede me. Y'all the new guys on the block. I've been doing this. Wait a minute. And they, the spirit, Holy Spirit revealed. He said, for I discern that's Holy Spirit revealing that you have jealous envy and bitter anger as a poison in your heart. Heart. And that poison is binding you to be a captive to sin. Jesus, help. We we cannot allow the a, a spike of bitterness to poison us to become and or remain captives to sin. We want freedom from sin. Simon begged, Peter, please pray to God for me. Plead with him so that nothing you just said over me may come to pass. That wasn't a repent. This is reminding me of Saul in the Old Testament when he um, kept the people alive that he was supposed to kill. And then he was like, well, it was the people. You, This is the blame shift. Let's go all the way back to Genesis 3. This is a blame shift. You're not wanting to take responsibility. Please pray to God for me. You pray to him for yourself. You repent for yourself. He already told you what to do. Repent. He taught, I can't repent on your behalf. I can intercede on your behalf, but you are going to have to open up your mouth and open up your heart and repent, change, turn from your ways. Let me look at this verse 24 in the Amplify. One moment, because I know that that word repent means something different in the Amplify. Um, let's see, verse 23. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in a bond forged by iniquity to fetter souls. And Simon answered, Pray for me, beseech the Lord, both of you, that nothing of what you have said may befall me. Okay, so it's not saying, it doesn't have the, re wait, go back up there when he said repent. So repent of this depravity and wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, this contriving thought and purpose of your heart may be removed and disregarded and forgiven you. So what is he supposed to do? You're supposed to repent repent of this depravity and wickedness of thinking that you can buy the anointing, thinking of, that you can buy spiritual authority, repent of these contriving thoughts and purposes that are in your heart. And you are asking God, you, when you repent, you ask God to remove and disregard and remove and disregard those thoughts and forgive me. 
And but then he gonna come back. Will you pray for me? No, I told you what to pray. And then they switched the subject. So that's why I said, did he really repent? Did he ever come all the way in? It's left open. The choice is if you're found there, will you really do what the word says? Anyway, keep going. Philip and the Ethiopian. So after Peter and John had testified and taught the word of God in that city, they returned to Jerusalem, stopping at many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the hope of the gospel. The Lord's angel said to Philip, now go south from Jerusalem on the desert road to Gaza. Let me say this. So the angel of the Lord begins to give you instructions. You thought you were going this way, but the angel says, go this way. Yeah. So he left immediately on his assignment. Christians on assignment talking about obedience. So he left immediately on his assignment. Along the way, he encountered an Ethiopian who believed in the God of the Jews, um, which is implied by the Aramaic word mina or homonym that can mean believer or eunuch. It is difficult to understand why a minister of finance would need to become a eunuch. Mm -hmm. Jesus, it's not difficult to understand. Anyway, um, he was a minister of the finance for Candace, queen of Ethiopia. He was on his way home from worshiping God in Jerusalem. As he rode along in his chariot, he was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go and walk alongside the chariot. So Philip ran to catch up. And as he drew closer, he overheard the man reading from the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet. Philip asked him, sir, do you understand what you're reading? And look, let me say this. This is a perfect example of just keep reading it. You may not understand it. Holy Spirit may speak to you direct, or he may send someone alongside to help you understand what you're reading. And you have a portion ministries here, and that's what we do. If you have biblical questions, email us at pauletx 7 at gmail.com to be able to respond to your questions. Do you understand what you're reading? The man answered, how can I possibly make sense of this without someone explaining it to me? Uh-huh. Or unless someone guide me. And that's reminding me of Romans, in the book of Romans, when it says, how can they hear unless that, you know, a, the... A, Somebody got to preach the word. Keep going. So he invited Philip up into his chariot to sit with him. The portion from Isaiah he was reading was this. He was led away to the slaughter like a lamb to be offered. He was like a lamb that is silent before those who sheared him. He never even opened his mouth. In his loneliness, in his loneliness justice was stripped away from him. Uh, which means he had no one there to defend him and stand up for justice. Jesus. And who could fully express his struggles? For his life was taken from the earth. As translated from the Aramaic, both the Greek and the Aramaic are difficult to translate. The Greek is, who can describe his posterity or who can describe the evil people of his time? The Aramaic word for struggles or sufferings and generation is the homonym dera. See Isaiah 53, verse 7 through 8. Okay, so we're at verse 34. The Ethiopian asked Philip, please, can you tell me who the prophet is speaking of? Is it himself or another man? Philip started with the passage and shared with him the wonderful message of Jesus. As they were traveling down the road, the man said, look, here's a pool of water. Why don't I get baptized right now? <laughs> Philip replied, if you believe with all your heart, I'll baptize you. The man answered, I believe that Jesus is the anointed one, the son of God. Big footnote, although only a few later Greek manuscripts include verse 37, it is found in one of the oldest Aramaic texts, the Herculean Syriac version, AD 616, and one Greek unisol from the 8th century. There is widespread consensus among scholars for both Greek and Aramaic texts that verse 37 was added as an ancient Christian confession of faith. Okay. So the Ethiopian stopped his chariot and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. They went down into the water. There was no need to go down into the water if it was a baptism of sprinkling. Philip immersed the believing Ethiopian man in baptism. So verse 40 when they came up out of the water, Philip was suddenly snatched up by the spirit of the Lord and instantly carried away to the city of Ashdod or Asetus. The translation of Philip 
was an amazing miracle as the city of Ashdod would have 15 miles, would have been 15 miles or more from the desert road to Gaza. This miracle of being translated also took place in Ezekiel 3, verse, uh, let me see, I'm at verse 40. I want to look at that footnote. Uh, mystic travel is what I'm going to call it, because that's basically what he's describing. He was translated. It was a mystical travel where the spirit of the Lord instantly carried him away, picked him up from one physical location and put him in another. And it's not just for the biblical days. It is for the right now. But this is why people have to be filled with Holy Spirit and allow him to dwell within so that we can get back to this kind of stuff right here. So keep going. So the city of Ashdod, where he reappeared, preaching the gospel in that city. The man never saw Philip again. He returned to Ethiopia full of great joy. Philip, however, traveled on to all the towns of that region, beginning, I'm sorry, bringing them the good news until he arrived at Caesarea. Um, this prominent Roman city uh, was also known as Caesarea by the sea. Okay, so that is all of uh, Acts chapter 8. And so let me put on my readers and come here into the Thompson chain. So it's talking about the persecution under Saul of Tarsus back at, at the beginning of the chapter. It look, and I, when I studied these, I'm telling you, I'm enjoying reading these for myself. If you have a Thompson chain, go in the back and read them. Uh, Lamentations, eagerness for truth. These are just the ones that I read. Persecution scatters the seed. And so then you have eagerness for truth, religious awakenings, teachableness, the ministry of healing, Simon the sorcerer, mm, he had self-exaltation, credulity, defecation, deification. He was trying to deify when we wanted to de be deified. Uh-huh. Seducers and evil influences. Then you have Peter and John at Samaria. Um, I looked at intercessory prayer, delayed blessings. Simon offers money for the gift of the spirit. That's a carnal mind. That's bribery. That's sin against the spirit. That's sacrilege. That's spiritual blindness. Um, temptation resisted, reproof, evil thoughts, repentance, prayer enjoined, spiritual discernment, bitterness, um, spiritual bondage, guilty fear. So then the Samaritans received the gospel through the testimony and the preaching and spiritual laborers and angels appear and divine direction and guidance. And then there's the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, which brings obedience and worshipers and spirit guides and divine direction. I looked at Christ's meekness and Christ's humiliation. Then we have Philip and the religious Ethiopian. So the he got converted, but then religion had to be shaken out of him. Instruction sought, eagerness of Eagerness for truth again, spiritual desire, whole heart, divinity. So then the eunuch baptized. And then at the end, it talks about how the gospel is universal. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that our eyes were open. And as we read these first eight chapters of the book of Acts, prepare us for when we come back. Chapter nine is a pivotal text in the book of Acts. We are, were saw, we saw him at the beginning of chapter eight. But at chapter nine, we're really going to see him and see his name get changed and all that stuff. So we thank you for being with us, for instructing us and showing us what we need to see in this portal of scripture. In Jesus name. Amen. See you in the next recording. Acts chapter nine. Be blessed.